Once again, you have reached The Real Dirt. On today's episode of The Real Dirt, we have Max Montrose of the Track Home Institute. Max is uh, taking a new way into educating people using science and observation, educating people on this new cannabis industry and this new thing we have. He's got a great online course he's going to introduce in this episode. It's called the NCIT. It teaches bud tenders or people new to the cannabis industry pretty much everything you need to know about the plant. So join us in this episode of The Real Dirt. Download it on therealdirt.com or iTunes, The Real Dirt Podcast. Once again, we are at... The Real Dirt Studios for another episode of The Real Dirt with Chip Baker. And today's guest is Max Montrose. How's it going, Max? Pretty good, Chip. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, it's good to be here, man. You know, we've tried to travel in the same circles for a while, but we've never been able to sit down and have a conversation on weed. I'm glad you're here. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, man. Did you you bring any weed today, by the way? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, some of that flower that I was just actually... (laughs) <laughs> it's one of the first questions I ask my guests. <laughs> you know, um, the flower that I was actually just puffing on uh-huh. upstairs before the show. Right. I, I didn't even think about it until you just asked me the question. Right. But that was actually a joint of um, uh, 50 different types of the best flower in the state of Colorado, all crushed in a one joint, which is... Um, it's kind of like a seventh generation joint so to speak so but way it, tastier it, so we, we call it the we call it the haggis um that was named by by jeff uh one of our buddies uh works with tricom but uh every time we do uh, a dope cup uh a cannabis cup for dope magazine we we pinch a little bud off of each bud that we grade and put it into the haggis jar and at the end we crush that and it's it's the entire cup's worth of bud. Oh, I get it. I get it. Haggis. Isn't that like a sheep or a goat dish from Ireland? Yeah, it's like it's it's all the intestines oh. from the animal in a in a soup. Um, oh, okay. Like basically, poor people eat because weed haggis. They didn't have money for 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 the meat parts. So yeah, it's the weed haggis. Weed it's, haggis. <laughs> <laughs> it's the haggis J. Yeah. 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 Awesome, yeah, and it that sounds great, man. It sounds great. Well, we we got we do have some weed weed to smoke here. Yeah, look at um, this big nugget. What is that? That looks a, like a sativa dominant hybrid. That is a old school train wreck hybrid. Look at that. Yeah, yeah the the original train wreck crossed with a couple other things, a, 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 a multi or a poly hybrid cross. Right on. Yeah, totally. So Max works with Tricome Institute, which is an educational organization, and he's trying to focus on all the complex problems of the cannabis plant. Isn't that a great way to focus that? Not only the cannabis plant, but I'd say the cannabis industry. Ah, the cannabis industry. Yeah, yeah. totally. Because I think both are complex, the the plant, the industry, uh, really everything to do with cannabis. Um, the more you get into it, the more you learn about it. The the more you you understand how how complex it is. But that uh, that complexity is nothing to be afraid of. For me, it's really fun. I I like how complex it gets. Yeah, a- absolutely. Uh, you're you're basically an educational group. I'll call it, and uh, we need more education in the cannabis industry. So much of it is bro science, as we call it at the grow store. Mm-hmm. You know, my bro did it this way, so I'm going to do it that way. Or, you know, my bro told me th- this indica sativa cross was the best, you know, to grow uh-huh. or whatever, you know, fiction people make around the cannabis plant. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, there's there's a reason for that. What What is it? Well. I'm going to roll it up here while you... you... Sure. Uh, Cannabis has been prohibited for 80 years. The 80th Mm. anniversary of cannabis, uh, the tax act from 1937, was just uh, two weeks ago. Right. Um, And actually, the the anniversary of the very first arrest, which happened a few blocks away from here on October 5th... Really? ...is coming up. 
And we should have a national holiday, I mean, a state holiday or something for that. Yeah, the first cannabis arrest happened here in Denver, Colorado, the place that actually legalized it first in the world, which is super cool. Um, Pioneers. Yeah, yeah, that was actually, I believe, on Larimer Street, somewhere around like 22nd and Larimer, which is literally just down the block. So, yeah, totally. Do you, do you, do you, <laughs> it's like actually like a few blocks that way. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, what was somebody was like selling eights on the street or something? I think he got busted something? with four right. pounds in, oh. his, in his apartment, and this was 1937. Wow. Yeah. But, um, so, anyways, I guess getting back, to the, set up. getting back to the point, um, you know, we, we haven't been allowed to study cannabis, and we, by being everyone, including universities, uh, research labs, uh, pharmaceutical companies in the U.S. because of, of its scheduling. Um, and so the amount of information that people know about cannabis really comes from, as you say, bros or, um, you know, people, what I would consider OGs, or really just homies in their basements. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the totally. biggest one of the biggest things that I see as a, as an educator is so many people trying to talk about um, you know Ed Rosenthal and Jorge Cervantes books about cannabis, <laughs> and what I try to remind people is is those authors are really good authors for the type of literature that they write, which is black market horticulture. That's what right. their expertise is in, and they're, they're not they're bros. not they're not experts in the plant cannabis, right? When you talk to a lot of cannabis experts, you'll find that a lot of people really haven't even started to really understand cannabis from a lot of fundamental and basic perspectives at first. And so uh, when we when we do interpreting, that's actually where we where we start people off. But that's a whole other thing. Right. No, no, no. That's, I think that's a perfect place to talk about it. So pronounce it and spell it. Interpening. Mm hmm. So a lot of people sometimes think it's called interpening. Mm -hmm. but it's called interpreting. That is a word that we designed to describe the process of interpreting terpenes. And so, you're looking for a lighter? Yeah, do we have a lighter here? What yeah, the yeah. fuck is a, going on with this, got, with this lighter supply, man? Don't worry, I've got a <laughs> Tricom Institute lighter right here. I'll save the day, bro. You can keep it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to get on my interns. You know, we're gonna, I think I'm gonna put another intern uh, ad out for someone to hold the lighters. I'm looking for an intern right now too. Mm. I need a I need a media director. Mm. Mm. That'd be a, an internship. I got so much mm. media needing directing. So in 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 interpreting interpreting <laughs> interpreting terpenes interpreting terpenes. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, and not only do we interpret those terpenes, but we also mix that interpretation, both what terpenes we we believe we're detecting, along with where in the trigeminal nerve in the face we feel we're detecting them in conjunction with the, the cola structure of the bud. Mm. Um, and when you put those three elements together, you can really designate the predetermined psychotropic effect of these hybrids, which is really important because we, uh, we're an industry that uses strain names, and those strain names don't really explain quality nor do they explain psychotropic effect, especially when the strain names aren't accurate. Absolutely. So we're, uh, we're, we're the kind of company in the industry that doesn't really care too much about strain names. We care a lot about um, many other things that we find to be more important about the flowers that we find in front of us. But I have a really fun video on, we've got a ton of videos for free on our website, trichominstitute.com, one of which is when I go Blue Dream secret shopping. Mm-hmm. And I buy six different types of Blue Dream in one day in Denver. And totally. we analyze each bud uh, in depth and, and really show you how and why the quality differs so drastically, but more so how so much of so many of these buds are so different from each other that obviously right. they're not Blue Dream. Right. Um, yeah, I call this market research. We do this all the time, too. Mm -hmm. Just go and buy uh, sacks of weed from different dispensaries. And uh, sometimes buy it knowing that it's not going to be Sour Diesel or OG Kush or Girl Scout Cookies or Blue Dream, just to buy it to see, you know, what it might be, right? Or just to jive the people. I'd never jive them publicly or on air, just privately with you later on, Max. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And I mean, we uh, we don't bust any dispensaries. Right. You okay. Know? And yeah. so we're we're not assholes, but we do tell uh, we do tell the the industry and the public a lot of true things about cannabis that mm -hmm. 
we feel are important that people should know? Yeah, this is one of my, I'm not going to call it a pet peeve. Well, I'll call it a pet peeve of, of the, the, the new cannabis industry is previously the sack you got was the sack that you could get, right? You didn't really have a choice. It was just your weed dealer had a sack that week, right? And so you bought it and sometimes it was good and sometimes it was bad. But we live in this like, like name brand, you know, order Amazon. I need Nikes or Converse shoes. And that's how people think when they go in the dispensaries. Because most people aren't as involved in depthly in cannabis and cannabis education as the three of us might be. They just go in and they're like, oh, I want Lollipop G13 Haze or I want, you know, the next stupid name, right? It, it, it's, it's literally just a name game in most places. Uh, people have heard about stuff like Blue Dream, Sour Diesel, Girl Scout Cookies. So you'll see those names on many, many, many menus, but they don't necessarily have the weed. You, you want to... Right? Yeah, so <laughs> I always have a ton of really fun analogies um, explaining cannabis and the industry. Um, and, like, in here, in, and I'll state this. Like, here's what's true. A lot of people also don't care. A lot of people don't give a shit, and that's okay. I'm they not, hit it once, and they're, they're oh, I'm so uh, high, the, and that's great. Uh, I yeah. used to be like that. Right, and, and the thing is, is the amount of people who buy Coors Light and Budweiser... Yeah. And and are just simply okay can, with that as a right. as a beer purchasing decision. Mm -hmm. Usually, these are people who don't know that all of those ingredients are you know extracted, genetically modified. Um, they don't come with the beer percentage because they don't want people <laughs> to know how low it is and why you have to buy twice as much as actual craft brew to like get the same effect. Um, I don't know, but the more you know and the more you care the more I think you can elevate your experience, whether you're drinking beer or smoking weed. Yep. Um, if you know, like, how to smell for f flushed cannabis versus unflushed cannabis or aged cannabis versus unaged cannabis and why aged cannabis is not quality and, like, how to smell for pungency and what terpenes are important to smell for and where and, and how that, you know promotes more bioavailability of the cannabinoids and why that will create more of a potent cannabis experience and why it's not just THC dependent and, and all these like really critical aspects that so many people um, w could benefit more from, from better knowing. Yeah, and absolutely. So, so this class that we teach, which actually we don't, we teach a couple blocks from here as well, um, 22nd and Welton usually, uh, we bring over a hundred types of cannabis to class to teach you how to see and smell the psychotropic versions and correlate that with the cola structures with many, many hours of lectures of speciation and like, what is cannabis flower? What, do, where does it come from? What are these plant types? And really kind of breaking it down from a serious way. But we also have probably the world's largest collection of really disgusting cannabis. Yeah. And so we let people smell what the different degrees of botrytis in area oh, right. and see totally. the different degrees of powdery mildew and the effects of insects and unflushed flower, nutrient burn, pre-ripe harvests, hemp types, ruderalis types, um, all sorts of like really interesting things that are yeah. very hands-on visual and olfactory uh, experiences. Absolutely, man. Yeah, most most people don't have that wide of experience with cannabis, nor they care, just like you, you pointed it out, really. Mm -hmm. They just want it to taste good, and they want to have this great, pleasant experience, mm -hmm. right? And it, it's kind of like Trader Joe's has some good, cheap wine. Okay. Right? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you know this, right? Yeah, but yeah. like, right, a friend of mine's one of the wine buyers for Trader Joe, explained it, how, how it all works to me. It's really interesting and complex, but they rely on sommeliers and people who really know and understand wine to pick their wine that then they sell for two dollars right right and you know it's not that it's bad wine it's just it's well selected correct right well so let me let's talk about that for a second let's talk about wine now that we used beer as sure. an analogy yeah yeah let's, but let's I, use I, wine I like, as an analogy i like no. wine and grapes better as an analogy than good beer, so for let's sure. all right for so sure. let's i'm gonna take you there let's go all right let's go let's walk into a liquor store together Okay. Cha ching Hey, Juan, how's it going, bro? What's up, homie? Hey, um, do you have this uh, specific species of grape um, at exactly this percentage of alcohol? No. 
I've got the alcohol and I've got the grape, but I don't have them together. <laughs> uh, you know, people who are sophisticated wine shoppers don't buy wine the way people buy weed. Mm -hmm. They ask for a selection within mm -hmm. a, su a certain numeric value. And so, oh, okay. with, so within this numeric value, right, which is picked by the wine spectators mm -hmm. and, or like a, a Robert Parker review, these are level three sommeliers who are deciphering qualitatively what value this vintage is. And Absolutely. thus, that, based that, on the supply that well, year. Not just the, not really supply, the quality of the vintage. Mm. Um, because that's what really commands price. And so most of these wine shoppers are, you know, looking for low 80s. But if you're feeling saucy one day and you deserve something like bigger, you might ask for the section of the 95s. Right. And so, and, and what that is, is that's a higher priced wine in a different section of the store that means something. And so you're shopping for something, you know, of... Of quality, and so um, when you walk into a cannabis store, and if what you're looking for is Blue Dream, at the end of the day, like, well, let's say that whatever they call it might not matter as much as what you're getting is cannabis that is like right. extremely ripe, well flushed. When you smoke it, it's going to be a it's clear, it clean experience. It's stinky flower right. that's going to like rip your face right. off. Uh, the terpenes are strong, and you know that somebody put it through a microscope so you didn't have to, so that it's been checked for bugs and all this other stuff. Right. We're right, the we're right. the only lab in the world right now that qualitatively looks for things in flower through our our tag process, uh, which came out of interpreting. Um, Trichome Assurance Grade. Correct. Yeah, we're we're the only we're the only company that has put together a standard operating procedure for what is cannabis flower quality and how do you measure that objectively? So that's a, a standard operating procedure for, for labs, businesses, buyers, people. Yeah, because mm -hmm. all of those things you just mentioned, all of those levels of culture right. and industry right. um, are affected by cannabis quality or the lack of it. Yeah, absolutely. So, sure. so you know, there's a lot of people out there who are trying to sell pounds of cannabis. There's like thousands of companies that are trying to sell thousands of pounds of cannabis out there right now. Right. And some of these pounds of cannabis deserve to be eight hundred dollars more yeah, right. than other pounds of cannabis. So, how does the market accept a scale of measurement that Man. everyone agrees to works? And and we and that's that's what we've put together, is is the start of something like that. One of like Colorado's that. and not just Colorado, but cannabis's biggest problem right now is there's a a set market price. There's often a high and the low. Colorado sets out an average, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and in other places, there just becomes like regional averages, right? You'll have a price that wholesale cannabis is in LA, one that there is in San Francisco, one that there is in Southern Oregon, right? But it's not based on quality, right? Like the wine industry is based on this quality or, mm -hmm. or availability or, or, so it's just, uh, it's almost more like commodities, right? Right. Than it is like wine or, or, or grapes where like the highest end product gets sold for the highest amount of money. How do we get to that cannabis world so that cannabis vision right and so that in and of itself is a is a complex process with 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 so many different hurdles and barriers you have cultural barriers you have s legislative barriers you have people who don't know what they're talking about there's a lot of barriers to not only this implementation but how to make it something that's real and true because cannabis the flower is so complex how do you look at a bud and say that's a 62.28. And so um, if, you, if you go to the homepage of trichomeinstitute.com, you can see all of the, the tag reports that we've done for flower, concentrates, tinctures, transdermals, and edibles for the dope cup, um, the most recent one, the Denver Dope Cup. Um, and dope, how, with Dope Magazine. With Dope Magazine. And how we do uh, microscopic photography and photos of each flower 
and have two certified level three interpreters, just like level three sommeliers, double blind grade the same flower, and then they independently of each other come up with the same numeric value, which is inner rate of reliability. Mm -hmm. And that's an objective process. Um, and so a good analogy for that is I walk one person into a room and I show them a splatter painting on the wall and I just ask them, tell me how beautiful that painting is from a scale of one to 100. Right. And then I ask another person to come into the same room and look at the same painting and they have to guess the exact same number of how beautiful a splatter painting is which is what a cannabis bud looks like under a microscope. Or to, yeah, most people can't even tell the differences between one to the next, honestly. Yeah, when you're looking right. at them real up close right. and, and really analyzing them. you don't have experience with it, yeah. but you want to get high, you can't, they're all green to you. Right, right. but to us, yeah. they, they are complex pictures, right. Right. really in-depth complex pictures that we're right. analyzing at a deep level. Um, and But the cool thing is, is uh, these interpreters, these level threes that are doing this tag process, they hit it on the money with hundreds and hundreds of samples processed in a week for a mm -hmm. cup and get them all within three points of each other on the 100-point scale with the, with the SOP sure. and, the, and the tag process and program that we've built. Sure, sure. And with predetermined psychotropic effect of each flower. And, I mean, the fun thing is, is when you get all these flowers in the indica category— and you're looking at the most beautiful sativa bud you've ever seen. And so what nobody, what people don't know, unless I guess you're listening to this podcast, is that what doesn't show up on the report that the public sees is what the Trichome Institute actually believes the flower type is from a psychotropic perspective, where we disagree <laughs> with, with how many dispensaries think their flower mm -hmm. is, quote unquote, an indica or a sativa. And so like when we use the word sativa... We don't mean anything to do with speciation because if you want to get into speciation of sativas, we can go there because I can talk your head off about that, but you're not going to find it in the dispensaries. Or yeah, so right. we truly right. have, the, have the science to believe that right now. And so when we say sativa, we mean a stimulating varietal yeah, based right. on these things. And so we put that in a sativa category, but we will put people's buds in our very own categories because we know what they are. And uh, cups are really interesting and fun, fun right. in that way. Right. Right. <laughs> so, so you just you use the 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 indica because I hate these terms. The indica and sativa as just the the psychotropic effect. Right, I can get on that for sure. For well, sure. Well, you There's, have to get on that right, because yeah, yeah, you, totally, so you have totally. to because the thing is, is you're not going to reverse critical mass right yeah, right now and like how Absolutely. how hardcore this misunderstanding uh, yeah. is and that's why when you look at the the interpreting loop on the interpreting tools you see it goes from indica to sativa and we talk about sativas because a lot of people will raise their hand in class and they're like well if you know that that narrow leaf drug type isn't a sativa then why do you say sativa and i say i say sativa because what we're doing is we're analyzing it for a predetermined psychotropic effect and right. the industry has a term for stimulating, and it's called sativa, sativa. based off of the misunderstanding yeah. of don't even let me go down the history road of how we got to that point. But yeah, it's absolutely. a long, it's a long story. I, I, I get it. I know. And that's and when I talk to people about it, that's what it ends up happening. Sometimes their eyes glaze over or sometimes they're like, you know, they can't they, they can't comprehend the like. The, the trade routes and the like misconceptions and the lawsuits and like how we got to where we are with, you know, it's yeah, right. <laughs> two identities of, of cannabis, right. It's that, a whole situation. It, it is a whole. And, and so people like you, you just, I just have a, a struggle but, talking to people with it because yeah, well, they just glaze over. I'm swimming upstream. I see what's going on. No shit. Right. But you, um, you want to know a real fun fact about those names? Yeah, absolutely. There's one type of cannabis that's federally illegal. Yeah, yeah, totally. This is the lawsuit I was I was speaking of. Right, right. Well, you know, if you look up the law, the only you know, when every time anybody's busted for cannabis, it's because it's 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 illegal and it's because it's right. federally illegal so and it's a felony. Cannabis sativa. It, it's cannabis sativa L. 
specifically. Right, right, right. 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 Cannabis sativa L. Mm -hmm. In every part of the plant, it's resins and it's byproducts, it's seeds, it's roots, it's stock, it's leaves, it's that flowers. That is the definition. It's oils, right. it's essence. Right. Anything that has anything to do with one species of cannabis, sativa L, is, is what's federally illegal. illegal. Absolutely. And what's interesting is, is that species of cannabis is genomically, phenotypically, and chemotypically hemp. And we all know it's a war on hemp and that this is where the 1937 thing started and, right. and what all that's about. But right. when you look at the narrow leaf drug types that the industry grows or the ones that people grow illegally in their basements or the ones that one million Americans get arrested for each year, those narrow leaf drug types we're finding are predominantly heavy genomically indica species and subspecies indicas. Right. And, right. and those aren't federally illegal. It doesn't really show up anywhere well, in, in the, in that the was, law. That was the, the lawsuit I was speaking of, but it was actually a Supreme Court case, right, early 70s, and someone brought that fact up. Yeah, right? actually, you know who brought that up one time in the early 70s? Probably the worst team of humans yeah, they didn't to win. ever they didn't bring, win. To bring that, to bring they that didn't fight win. up. It was a motorcycle gang. Right, right. Yeah, it was like the Hell's Angels or something. So yeah, I mean, they, the thing is, is their facts were correct. But when like when you have a yeah. motorcycle gang in like a Texas Supreme Court house or something in the seventies, it's never gonna win. Right. So why don't we bring up? <laughs> well, that's, why don't we bring up that argument hey, now that we have more like speciation information and science yeah. and other stuff? Because like that, that's, and that's a, why the Supreme Court chooses their cases. So they're like, no, we can't win that one. Oh, <laughs> we can win that one. Wait. Oh yeah, we can win that one. Right. And then, you know, religious use of cannabis was also shot down. And, and uh, man, I love the story, but those guys were also a little dubious. It was, you know, they were smuggling in tons of weed from Jamaica <laughs> and brought up a religious use offense. And, you know, it's great. I love the story, you know, and I believe in it, but like it didn't work for them either. You know, uh, and that's what that's what ends up happening. But I, th I think someone should bring it up again. You know, there there's uh but I don't know. There's there's so many other ways to deal with the cannabis industry. Hey, you know, we need to take a break. We've just been chatting like little stone school boys here. So uh, this is Real Dirt with Chip Baker and Max Montrose. These new episodes are made possible through some really awesome partnerships. We want to form long-term relationships with other entities who have similar goals. Thanks to Grower Soil, a line of soil and nutrients manufactured and developed right here in Colorado. Also, thanks to Cultivate Colorado with two stores in the Denver metropolitan area. Cultivate has one of the largest selections of indoor to horticultural equipment in the known universe. So stop by if you have any growing needs. Grow your dreams, cultivate your legend. And we're back. Wow, what a break, man. I did not believe you could do that many push-ups and crunches after we smoked that huge blunt. That was incredible. <laughs> you just watch how many more are going to go down before the show is over. <laughs> oh, man, you and Seth, dude. Seth's our uh, technical producer here at The Real Dirt. Um, they had a uh, pull-up competition here during uh, the break, uh, and you had to, like, you know, take a puff of this large joint every time you pulled up, right? It was pretty impressive. That's pretty, yeah, that's a, yeah, Seth, that's weed Olympics stuff. Yeah, yeah, Seth totally won. I was surprised. Wow. Right, yeah. I, I knew you could do the pull-up thing. I just didn't know you could do the weed smoking thing. <sighs> <sighs> so, man, I got, I got something fun for us to do here. I got some weed. Let's look at this weed. All right, here, weed sample number one. I've just handed Max a sack of cannabis. Uh, he's looking at it and... This isn't the finest of cannabis, I don't believe. I mean, it's definitely the organic. Is this is this soil or this is soil? I believe it was uh, probiotically grown in soil. Probiotically grown yeah. in soil. So, okay. Yeah, I mean. So what's wrong with it? Let's start there. <laughs> I handed him a, a sack of bad weed to see what was wrong with it. So, first of all, it'd be helpful if I had my... Uh, your scope, my loop on I'm, me. I'm sorry, you know, I don't. I've misplaced my loop. I usually bring my loop everywhere I go, but so the thing is, is you see a lot of kind of darker coloration mm -hmm. when yeah, you open on, the base of the butt up. Sure, on the oh yeah, totally. 
And totally. so when it has that kind of right. like brownish, reddish rusting, and it's just right. faint, uh huh, you can't really see on the outside of the bud the botrytis scenario that's mm-hmm. growing on the inside. Totally. And a lot of that kind of dank smell, that's the difference between an unattractive dank smell versus an attractive dank smell. Right. Because the word dank in the cannabis culture comes from the the smell of a wet basement in a good way. (laughs) Yeah. Right. But but that's dank. But what this this is is has botrytis, but it it, hasn't gone to but in a very, very minimal effect. You can also see it it hasn't you damaged can, the bud so much. So here's the thing. You can right. see a little bit of that fungal type arranging its structure around the style and stigma oh, yeah. of the of uh which are the pistols. And oh, so okay. it's just a totally. little brown oh, yeah. fuzziness oh, around yeah. those buds. So this is like, you know, so sometimes like a lot of the nice it has a different feel to it. That's how organic I always California it. outdoor stuff. If it if it's not consistently um taken care of in either like a foliar or a systemic way Mm. with certain agents that uh, really prohibit this fungus from from attaching right um then then it usually attaches from from organic outdoor flower flower grows it's really hard to actually have cannabis that doesn't have it um totally this was grown in a, a jungle setting in a greenhouse that's sure it was probably uh, and that's more yeah. susceptible to, yeah, to that totally. environment so that makes even more sense um and then you know just looking with my naked eyes on whatever trichomes i can see um a lot of them also seem to be a little post ripe mm. um and then another thing is the the bud is in a in a plastic bag which does have a permeable membrane and so because terpenes are in a state of constant evaporation, um, it's like pouring a beer, and so the CO two okay. is is fresh when the when the flower's fresh, but when you leave that beer overnight, that beer bubble kind of like starts to subside because the amount of gas energy it has um, kind of dissipates, and so when you keep it in a in a dark environment or something um, more like a jar, something that uh, right. The right. air can't escape. The the cure really helps it settle in and, and preserve those terpenes as, as long as possible. So the thing is, is the the richness of those terpenes are not really there uh, due to it being probably harvested a little late. Uh, it wasn't kept appropriately necessarily. It's not trimmed very well. It's got a nice dense cola structure to it, but it definitely has uh, little flares of botrytis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I believe this guy's main problem was that he he couldn't dry it properly, right? Uh, I mean, he might have had problems going into the dry room, but uh, uh, that was that was his story anyway. Um, he's off grid; it's raining every day where he is, you know. Right. That, that sounds like yeah. a, a right a perfect fungal environment. Right. Right. And and a problem that Colorado typically doesn't have is drying weed out at yeah, any absolutely. point in time. Right. Right. I always tell people who come from like, you know, wetter environments from the East Coast or wherever that like, if you stay here for two weeks in the winter, you'll get a new pair of lips and hands (laughs) because you'll dry out. It's negative humidity here. Yeah, This place will suck it out of you and your weed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good place to be. It's just. So what, (laughs) yeah. What, what would you recommend somebody doing with that, that type of weed? Uh, you know, slinging it to the homies on the block. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, dude. Right, right, uh, you right, could right, make, right, you, right. you know, go upstairs, put it in a pan uh, with some butter and uh, maybe cook it down and extract it. And and then, you know, all of the critical thinking listeners right now are like, well, does the botrytis extract into the butter? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that the, I don't know. I, I don't know, I, man. I hope that the temperature of, of decarboxylation would kill yeah. minimal fungal uh, cells that you would probably smoke anyways. Because if if nobody told you what right, this what was, because it? It, it doesn't look like it's it, molded. It doesn't There's look no, moldy at all. You, until you you'd, break it open, you'd have and you to, see it. You'd have to be a, a level it. three interpreter to be able to crack open a nugget on the fly like that and, right. and dissect its qualitative analysis without right. a loop. Right, right. 
Yeah, you can smell it. I can smell it. You can smell it. Right, right, right. right. When you show it, yeah. it also has like a, a yeasty smell to me as well. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm uh, I'm not sure if that's a different uh, mold or fungal infection right. on it, but yeah. I mean, so here's the deal. At the end of the day, if you smoke this, will it hurt you? Probably not. Uh, is there science on what happens to people who smoke flour with botrytis on it? No. Mm. Does there need to be that science? Yes. Does there need to be science about, you know, cooking it into edibles? Yes. But there's also been a lot of people who've been doing this for a long time, a lot of hippies in their California backyards who throw bud rot buds in a, you know, in a, in a one pound sack for sale or um, cook it up as brownies. And so, and, yeah, right. and probably have, have survived to smoke to another bowl. Tales. Yeah, yeah, so... I mean, I, you know, there was a time where the only weed in the country for most of us were was bricked up, molded Mexican weed. Brick pack, yeah. Right. <laughs> well, well, yeah, and... Always hallucinating. No, that. I'm just trying to get this little... Uh, you've got a, a fungus gnat is what it looks like. If I were to There's name the... A fungus gnat. Bullshit, you got a fungus gnat or something right around here. <laughs> 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 I haven't taken anything uh, hallucinogenic today. <laughs> but uh, speaking of Mexican brick pack, I just got back from Mexico and oh, buddy, yeah, yeah. I, there is some quality ganja out there. Oh yeah, man. I've been going down to Mexico the past couple of years and getting it. It's quality been smoked, like weed, dude. Like, oh man, it's totally impressed me. European seeds been introduced down there. Grow technique has been introduced down there. Right, and now, like, you can go to the beach, Puerto Vallarta, and well, buy a $60, like, sack of pretty good weed, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I was, I, I w- I'm always fortunate enough to be in a position where the guys who are kind of, like, at the top of their game in their industry, and the circle that they're in is is a place that I kind of, like, find myself out when I go to these certain events, like mm-hmm. it did in Mexico, and so... um when you're in kind of like the circle of the guys who are really the first dudes who are taking this stuff seriously and learning those grow techniques and and searching for those European seeds, as you say, or really coming from America to the U S I'll say, I just hear the story from the wheat, from the seed sellers in Europe. Yeah. People buying five gallons of seeds. I'm just saying that like, there's some, there's a couple of cats out there who just really know what they're doing. And, uh, and and what they're really starting to get interested in now is, is extracts. But what's interesting is, is what they don't have is they have no, uh, no one to really show them the ropes and they also don't have the proper equipment. And so what I did is when I was down there, I lectured on, uh, kind of the dangers of dabbing from a black market extraction perspective, um, with just how much can be condensed, how many pesticides, fungicides, funguses, insects, right. polyaromatic hydrocarbons, flammable uh, solvents, and uh, heavy metals that can all be in one hit along with your THC. So uh, there's a lot to consider in terms of uh, doing extracts so from they- a qualitative perspective as well they're doing butane and propane extraction down there. Yeah. 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 But, but they're doing it the way, you know, the industry did it up here before it was regulated. Right. Where you had to kind of have at a minimum, a $20,000 closed loop system with a, you know, a gas percentage higher than 30 times or something like that, where these kids are, you know, still running five times, three times refined butane cans into copper pipe bombs with like minimal, trash shake going through it and it's some it's some gnarly stuff the other thing that i saw that wasn't like the really dangerous gassy stuff was they're uh doing a lot of these alcohol extractions and so they were really dabbing kind of like homemade rick simpson oil if you will <laughs> it's just this black tarry totally. old school dense, hash oil. that's old school hash oil yeah, right. just alcohol extract that right. they yeah that they were like dabbing these little mini dab rigs at these parties. But like you'd go to a couple parties and they got torches and rigs and their little kits and they got their extracts and some of them are alcohol, some of them are maybe right. one or one's lucky enough to be CO two, but a lot of them are kind of these butane, propane. One of them, uh, one extractor down there uh, has a has a closed loop, but you know it's small. Wow, all small. And they're new to it. Yeah. Are they, are they, I mean, 
there's all there's all people in the market there, right? There's like people just like here. There's people that are doing it on their back porch, and there's commercial growers that are doing it, and then there's just commercial people that are buying weed to do it. Yeah, but you know the since we've had a really good conversation about quality, <laughs> right. we'll just I just want to put that. Uh, I think there's a spectrum of quality from mm-hmm. extracts. You can extract a 100% organic plant in a rosin press or a really quality, clean butane or propane extract or even CO2 extract, make a quality live resin or shatter that is really low in PPMs to no PPMs or no pesticides. There are people who can make really clean quality extracts all the way to what, you know, you just mentioned the black market stuff on their back porch, which is... Um, a some pretty toxic stuff, right? Can be right. For yeah, sure, for sure. That's how it is, man. It's, you know, they're just starting in the game. But so, what are the laws have just recently changed in Mexico? Right? They have medical now. They have po- like like uh, possession of up to an ounce or two. What's going on there? State controlled still. They just passed a little bit of legislation that says that they're really serious about passing more legislation about having a medical program that would be operated through doctors and pharmacists. Mm. So they're really not talking about a dispensary scene right now, but the cannabis scene down there just in general, kind of like it is around the world, is the whole world is trying to wake up the rest of society to like the need for uh, retail adult use cannabis and how that cuts down on crime and promotes taxes and, and all this other stuff. And so um, as they're simultaneously working towards medical, I think there's also groups down there who are also working towards uh, turning that into a retail model or also pl- uh, clubs and places where, where you can use it. But you have to understand Mexico's also um, way more complex than any of the other places in the world that are going through this legislative process because the majority of the government is really cartel controlled and the right. cartel's political interest is for cannabis to stay illegal. And so right. Right. the opportunity to legalize it, even though it might make sense for the people and it might produce more tax dollars for the government right. and and all of these really beneficial things that, that Mexico needs and, and needs to benefit from, um, it might be difficult to, to get some of that legislation passed. Right. From a drug lord's perspective, growing cannabis in Mexico is pretty nice. You, like, don't pay for the land, the water, right? You pay some people off. Your, all your labor's really cheap. I mean, you know, they've got great sun and water down there if, you, if, if they improve their technique. Right. You know, yeah. and uh, I mean, Mexico becomes the new Canada, so to speak. Right. You yeah. think that's going to happen? I think Mexico's a long way away from being anywhere near Canada. Yeah. Because I think <laughs> I think the states are a ways off from being anywhere near Canada in terms of like how they sometimes build some of their operations are pretty solid and pretty, pretty right. up to date. No, yeah. Clean. In that respect, absolutely not. I just more meant the, you know, ca- Canadian, you know, cannabis trafficking that was commercial late 90s, mm. early 2000s has gone away now pretty the much. The BC bud. The BC bud day. Oh, yeah. Is, BC right. chronic. Yeah. Yeah. Is it big, you know, the, the, the Mexi chronic? Because I've smoked lots of great, you know, weed from Mexico. Right. I don't, I mean, here's the, here's the thing. Chronic bud, really good, good weed needs yeah. to be really fresh and really stinky. Right, and it's a transportation issue. And, I get the, that. and the thing is, is they crush and jam these flowers so tight to get as much mm. through a tight space as possible. And the amount of time that it takes for that flower to go through the desert on a burlap sack is like, I mean, those right, those right. terpenes are gone. It's, not- it's full of seeds and stems. They, they've they literally, you know, they just seed fields and try to, I guess, pay people to pull males out of them, but everything gets seeded anyways. Oh, right. They have a hard time. Yeah, I mean, they got some things to do. It's the transportation issue is the biggest thing. That's why, I guess, extract is, like, I guess Mexican extract would be the thing. It's not the weed. Well, I think Brazil right? is going to be big in that because, uh, you know, Brazil is coming on pretty heavy, and, and that's what they're really going towards, too, as well, but... 
from a moving perspective, extracts right. are definitely easier to move. That's why there's more <laughs> they're doing it. hash mm-hmm. in, in Israel than there is flour that right. comes from, from their it's neighbors. It's easier to store, right? It lasts Absolutely. longer, it goes in it's smaller space. Travel. It's a whole easier Smuggling thing to do. 101. Yeah, so like to have quality flour, you kind of need to be right. in an open market where you don't have to cram your buds into a burlap sack and transport it mm-hmm. by slave right. labor. We don't right. really need that, which is why you haven't seen uh, Mexican, the, the the brick pack swag from the cartels. You haven't seen that stuff in Colorado in close it, to 10 years. Yeah, it's uh, it's fallen off all over the country, right? A lot of this, a lot of those cartels, though, came into the U.S. and started grows throughout California and New Mexico and even Texas. Yeah. Right, because they figure they could just grow on the other side of the border. Right. Right, it changes the appearance of it a little bit. Yeah, but there's those right. guys are the guys who camp out at those illegal yeah, grows right. in the national yeah, forest. Totally, they grow some shitty weed, dude. Yeah, they grow. Yeah. It's not. It's not. You know, even even people who don't make that much money can go to a dispensary nowadays and buy decent flour. Right, right. It's it's and, just and like even you, and even shake. People even go into the dispensary and just buy sugar shake from from Chronic Buds. You know, you can get right. a, an ounce of shake for forty dollars. To roll your joints with, that sometimes last people yeah, two or three dude. weeks. Even cheaper, man. It's in, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's pretty incredible. And I don't know 70, why. I don't know. dollar eights. I don't know why you would smoke leaves. I don't think people understand yeah. that they're that they're leaves that they're smoking. No, they don't. They just get the pre roll. They're it's, like, oh, I'll take the four dollar pre roll. Right. Right. It's like of leaves. Yeah, you know, like right. how apples sometimes come with a little leaf on the stem. Yeah. And you have to like trim the leaf off of the apple to get to the fruit. Right. Yeah. Right. Imagine a bag of those leaves. <laughs> <laughs> and like oh, that's what you're eating. And it's like, okay. Have you have you seen the Cranford cigarettes? Uh uh-uh. uh. In the Cranford? Do you know yeah. Um uh yeah, I was just at the event last night at the THC Championships put on by THC Connoisseur magazine. Mm-hmm. The temp oh man, I'm so bad here. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was the THC Championships. For yeah, sure. the Hemp Connoisseur magazine. Yeah, okay. No, you're good. And um, so, uh, Cramford cigarettes. I think that's what they were called. It was a, a a cigarette of leaves filter. You know, like a cigarette filter. It looked like you were smoking a, you know, a Marlboro, uh-huh. right? Uh, Viceroy or Cool or whatever your cigarette uh-huh. brand is. Uh, but it was it was leaves. Uh-huh. I'm pretty sure it was just trim. Great. Yeah, it was sticking out the end of it. Perfect. Right. Great. <laughs> that's that's quality. That's the Budweiser. That's, that's quality. The, that, let's bring it back to Coors. There it is. That's what Coors looks like, huh? Yeah. I mean, pre rolled leaves. Yeah. Well, I uh, I appreciate quality craft brew from small establishments that put a lot of creative energy and heart into their. Mm. operations and totally. produce some really like unique and distinctful yummy things to consume yeah absolutely uh yeah there is that need though for the a lower so you mentioned earlier at the beginning of the episode that people buy weed based on the the thc content and the name strain right there does need to be that other level where people buy it because they just want to smoke some weed that tastes good Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, 7% or 8% if you want to take those values for it. Something half the size, half the strength, right? Or even less, yeah. right? There's a, there's there's tons of people out there that smoke low quality cannabis because that's all they can get. But it's the, the buds that we may smoke mm-hmm. way too strong for them, right? Yeah, THC does not depend on quality because if my, uh, if, if uh, some of the sick people that come to me um, that I, uh, I help a few people out from time to time. A lot of the flour that I'll recommend to them, which is really high quality flour, very clean, very pristine, very healthy, clean, and uh, ripe flour, has no THC in it. And so I serve some some friends and some sick people who are close to me flour that you know is eighteen percent CBD, right, and zero percent THC. And it's not like my flours are. Are poor quality. They're not. They're they're great quality. Right. Right. There's Absolutely. just no THC in them. So right. the the chemotype, the cannabinoid structure and the terpene structure and 
cola structure as well. The inflorescence of a flower, the shape of a bud, does not dictate quality. I have seen some squirrely, bizarre, freaky, psychedelic-looking flowers out there right? that are some of the best stuff you, you've ever seen. Totally. And it's not that it's really like a, dense... A stem with nugget red hairs that you on see it. on the front of like a right. High Times magazine. Oh, right, yeah. right. So, um, so I don't really discriminate by like color and shape and texture. I'm pretty open-minded. Yeah, absolutely. People, when people, you know, when it, it's hot, well, you mentioned sativas earlier and how nobody would want to buy that. You know, it's a, a stick with some red hairs on it, right? But if you smoke a joint with someone, they're like, oh my God, my heart's pounding out of my chest. Holy shit, what is it? You know? Well, so right. not, not necessarily. So, um, yeah, some people, I would buy it if they had, if they had like, you know, I'm, some I'm flowering Colombian Thai I'm, I'm, right now. I'm flowering sativa it. species, subspecies sativa right now. Yeah, do you bring work? That bring. was, uh, so I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm smoking. flowering and breeding a, uh, a plant that was brought to me from Kansas. And that's the kind of Kansas ditch weed. And we're going to chemotype right. it and we're going to genotype it because what we're curious is if we can go back in time and decipher if this plant is indigenous to the United States or if this was right. government funded hemp that was distributed to farmers to grow for World War I. Yeah. Um, and so, like, what is this residual cannabis plant that grows wild that nobody can get rid of all over Nebraska and Kansas Midwest area? Yeah. Um, and so, like, where does it come from? And, like, what is it? But we can tell you for a fact, it is, this thing is a sativa, you know? And I bet you it has no THC in it. And I bet you it's probably got something like 4 to 5% CBD. But what's, but what's really going to be interesting is, like, how much CBG or how much CBN? Sometimes when or you, other ter terpenes, maybe you know. Sometimes when you uh, cannabinoid hunt some of these really exotic varietals, you can get spikes in uh, sub cannabinoids that are are really interesting for other reasons and purposes. Sure. Oh, the future of it all, man. Lot lots of research. So, man, we we didn't even get to. Uh, we're at the end of the episode, but uh, but I got to ask you a handful more things here. <laughs> Tell me about this online course. If people want to to know how to be a level three interpreter, <laughs> Inter interpentiner, interpentiner. How, yeah. how do how do you, how you've just come out with an online course? Uh, yeah, right. Uh, we have, but it's not a uh, it's not an interpreting course. Oh, okay. But we do need to come out with our level right. one interpreting okay. course. So you just soon. come out. You just come out. We with plan to come out with next is is interpreting level one, right? Because people around the world want to take that, and we want. Oh, absolutely. And we want people to be able to take that class before they come to Colorado for level two, because you have to, you have to come to Colorado for level two, because uh, we teach you on a hundred types of cannabis. We can't right. really take that out of state. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you do have an online course. It's just about something different. Our new online course is called Cannabis Product and Sales Training. And so uh, we wrote a textbook on all cannabis product types um, and also how to understand them to better recommend them to different types of people, whether they're medical or adult use consumers, specifically in a dispensary setting. And so um, we go really in depth with smoke and vapor and the difference between vape pens versus other vape pens versus other vape pens versus tabletop vaporizers versus smoke and the difference uh, between the pharmacokinetics of those deliveries of those cannabinoids and terpenes. Um, but we go in depth into edibles and why and how they're um, chemically a different drug in how uh, we really need to be more careful with them than most people really know. But yeah, right. we go into hash and concentrates, all the different types of hash and concentrates and what makes them different and, and how to work with them, sublinguals, transdermals, topicals, suppositories, personal lubricants, hash. Uh, uh, we, we do um, equivalency scale conversions, product weight measurement, uh, customer service and uh, dosing, um, all in product, oh, excellent. cannabis product and sales training. So it's a, a CPST certification. Oh, awesome for the uh, 
a cannabis entrepreneur or bud tender. Yeah. So uh, business owner, cannabis curious, all those people be interested in that. Yeah. So what we've done is for people who are looking for a certification to get a job in the industry or for um, dispensary owners who need their staff better trained, which increases the safety of, you know, the product consumption, um, but also increases sales because they're talking about their products in a more real way and people are more comfortable buying those. It's also great for insurance purposes and MED enforcement. Um, but, you know, you can buy the whole course, uh, whether you're getting into the industry or already in the industry. But if you're a parent who wants to just better understand edibles and why they're either a really good option for your kid or maybe the worst option for your kid, uh, you can buy just the chapter on edibles for just $20. Yeah, right. Um, and so we sell the chapters individually. So if somebody out there is just wants to geek out on, you know, United States hash and concentrates and what they are and how they work and all that stuff, you know, for 20 bucks, you can really, you know, geek out on that uh, with some of these new courses, which you can find at uh, trekminstitute.com. Mm, awesome. So uh, what, what's the future, man? What's the future of cannabis? It's always a tough question. I'm pretty optimistic about it because I feel like we've got a pretty good thing going here. Um, it's, but it's hard to, it's hard to fight and argue with stupid. Mm. And so we're kind of in a, in a uh, leadership time period that doesn't agree with this plant and this industry from from no perspective other than we feel like we should carry on this tradition because it's a part of our party's ideology of what we stand for. We're not going to really abide by looking into the science or we're not going to really like accept the fact that it does have medical benefit or that it is decreasing teen usage and accidents and hospitalizations and, you know, so many other in crime and so many other things and really increasing tax revenue and, and all the beneficial things. And so instead of like looking at the future logically, um, it could be it could be detrimental if if people don't stand up and fight against that insanity, you know. Um, I think it's really easy to just tell people the truth. In, instead of like the D.A.R.E. program, trying to scare right. kids about what cannabis is, that's what the government tries to do with adults. It's the same program. And so instead of trying to like freak people out and then making a huge black market and surging cartels and surging undergrounds and <laughs> making everything go backwards uh, from, from what progress is and means, it's like, how about you just tell the truth? Cannabis yeah. doesn't hurt people. It's way easier than alcohol. Tax it. Regulate it. The sky has not fallen out of Colorado. People are okay. The roads have actually gotten much better. Hospitals are getting bigger. The schools are getting so much money. I'm looking at, well, yeah, we. Uh, I was on a, on a committee that w just helped the tax revenue go from $2 million to $9 million, um, for certain school programs specifically. Wow, yeah. From, from cannabis money. That's awesome. Yeah. We're doing it for the kids. Uh, yeah. We're doing it for the kids here in Colorado. Yeah, if you want to help kids in Colorado in schools, just go uh, buy, go buy legal weed. weed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's leave <laughs> it on that, Max. This has been an awesome episode. I feel like we just kind of got into, into it all. I'm going to have to have you back, and we can talk about specifically history of cannabis, cannabis indica, cannabis sativa. I think that would be a great episode, but we're, we're going to have to like do that a whole other day. Yeah, we just kind of scratched the surface here. Right, absolutely. It's something I've been really wanting to chat about. So Max Montrose with the Tricome Institute, and this is Chip Baker with The Real Dirt. Thanks for joining us. Download this episode and other episodes at therealdirt.com or on iTunes, The Real Dirt Podcast. Stay high. Damn, Max Montrose is a funny motherfucker. Thank you for joining me today. It, it, this is one of my favorite conversations I've had. I hope you learned something from it. And I, I really think a little bit differently about how people judge cannabis and how people are going to judge cannabis in the future. Don't forget to check out Max's online course, the NCIT. And if you're interested in this or other episodes of The Real Dirt, download it on iTunes, The Real Dirt Podcast, 
or come to us, therealart.com. Get other interesting things as well. Stay tuned for the next episode and definitely stay high. Stay high.